What's good, y'all? It's Bro Ross back at again with another video. So we're gonna check out WWE pay-per-views, a resurgence by none other than Super Kick Studios. I was actually thinking about this the other day, and uh, some people have mentioned this um, just in their videos, like uh, Solo Monster. If you guys are subscribed to him, I am subscribed, and he mentioned this as well. The main shows like Monday Night Raw and SmackDown, even though SmackDown is, you know. In my opinion, it's a it's a better show because of the two hour time limit, and you know they kind of they have no other choice but to get straight to the point. So it's much more easier to digest. But the weekly shows, a lot of times they're not as good. They're not. I actually sometimes they can be kind of boring or downright bad at times. But for whatever reason, recently we've seen for about maybe going on a year now, a little bit maybe more that the main shows like the PLEs or the pay-per-views whatever you want to call them they've been actually quite entertaining like the weekly shows have been sometimes good most of the times mid and kind of uneventful but when we get to the main pay-per-views for whatever reason they've been pretty good sometimes great it's crazy to say that I remember a time where the weekly shows weren't that good and the pay-per-views weren't that good most of the time or there would maybe be one match that you cared about for whatever reason i don't know what is you know obviously you know triple h does have some creative control when it comes to how these shows are are structured and laid out but bruh i i've been thinking about this and it's been on my mind and it's cool that he actually made this video talking about it but the pay-per-views slash ple's have actually been consistently good i don't think uh, it's it, it takes i have to really think about the last ple that was just like boring uninventful you know i i, I you know didn't really care about anything that happened on the show had to be maybe before SummerSlam last year i'm thinking maybe a couple of the pay-per-views before SummerSlam last year where i was just like all right this this was kind of kind of uneventful but other than that this was the recent strings of P, uh, pay-per-views and ple's have been fantastic so we're gonna check out how he feels about them you know what's his thoughts and opinions on them appreciate all the love and support let's get right into this one man whether it's Brock Lesnar lifting the ring with a tractor, a surprise return, or another big moment in the saga of the bloodline, it seems as though after every WWE pay-per-view in recent times, there's always a big talking point. Those mm -hmm. same talking points a while beforehand were different and had a much more negative fan response attached to them. For the past year, it seems as though WWE has been on a consistent run of good to great pay-per-views. Yeah. More stadium shows, more international pay-per-views, crazy crowds, match of the year contenders, and angles that have you hooked. And having watched as many pay-per-views as I have, I don't remember a consistently good run like this ever. Not in the Ruthless Aggression era, not in the 2010s, not in the early 2020s, but for about a year now, there's been no pay-per-view which just comes and goes and gives you absolutely nothing of substance. Mm -hmm. And it all began with the Triple H takeover. It was Money in the Bank 2022, and the show, to say the least, was not the greatest. It was carried by a strong tag team match between the Street Profits and mm -hmm. the Usos and a Liv Morgan cash-in, and aside from that, things were pretty rough. But then came Triple H's first show at the helm, SummerSlam 2022, live from Nashville, I Tennessee. Just said that. And the thing with SummerSlam is, for the longest time, they told us that this was the second biggest show of the year. But they never actually did anything to make it feel like that. It didn't have its own identity. It wasn't the spectacle that a number two show should be. And at points, it was a joke. But as of 2021, they've started to treat the show much more differently. There's a theme to each show. The show comes to us from bigger venues, which gives it a more grand feeling. Simple things like redesigning the logo on a yearly mm -hmm. basis and giving it an accompanying presentation has given it a lot more personality. This one was built around a match that not many people wanted to see, and that was these two. Yeah. But before we got there, Becky Lynch and Bianca Belair perfectly topped off their trilogy with another great match. Mm -hmm. The same event at which Becky returned the year previous, it's mm -hmm. the same show where Bianca got her stamp of approval and won this rivalry. And after this is where the surprises began, because yep. out came Bayley after a year away, and she didn't come alone. Triple H had re-signed Dakota Kai and brought up EO Sky from NXT. So in the beginning alone, you had a huge moment made. 
Logan Paul had a great performance, as he mm-hmm. usually does in the WWE, and the rest of the show wasn't anything too crazy. And then came the main event, and somehow, someway, Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns were able to put on a masterclass of a last man standing match. Yeah. Right off the hop, this was everything you'd want in a battle between two powerhouses. It was hard hitting, it was a brawl, the crowd was into it. Two big boys just going out there punch for punch, and then Brock Lesnar. This match was definitely <laughs> um, better than their WrestleMania match. This match was, this was fun. This, this was a really good last man standing match. It will be a last man standing match that people will always remember. That's crazy to say. Lesnar just casually does something that I never thought I would see in the WWE. He raises the ring, sending Roman Reigns off the map like this was fall, guys. But it was Roman who got the win. The Triple H PLE era had officially began. Mm -hmm. The next show was even crazier. Just a few weeks later, WWE made their return to the UK for a pay-per-view for the first time in 20 years when we got Clash at the Castle. And this show was not messing around. You already knew that the UK crowd was going to bring in another element to this show, and they did exactly that. Now, the change was obvious. Quality rather than quantity. Mm -hmm. And if you want quality, look no further than these two. Gunther and Sheamus went out there and they tore a hole through each other, beating Max. the life out of one another <laughs> till the other just couldn't go anymore. And Gunther won this match in a match of the year contender. Max. It won't be the last time that I say that in this video. This nope. was also the show where Dominic <laughs> turned heel and as they say, the rest is history. It came at such a big show and the fact that he turned on his own dad only made things bigger for him. Yep. Rollins and Riddle had a fun match and then we came to the main event which had a big time <laughs> feel unlike any other. Drew McIntyre versus Roman Reigns, undisputed Universal Championship on the line. Coming into this, Drew was built up like an actual monster, and they made you believe that he could actually do it. Mm -hmm. The crowd favorite really had a chance. It became more of a possibility when we had a Broken Dreams prelude before his entrance. Such a great moment to add to a hard-hitting match filled with so many close calls. So good, so good. thanks to Solo, it Mm. wouldn't be. This show, though, was one for the ages. And when we talk about shows in the WWE, gimmick pay-per-views make up a lot of these shows. Hell in a Cell, Extreme Rules, TLC. Well, it seems as though most of those are a thing of the past now. But the Extreme Rules we got in 2022 was actually pretty fun. The strength of that was leaning into the fact that it's called Extreme Extreme Rules, rules, not (laughs) Normal Rules. You guys remember how they called it that and would just have standard one-on-one matches? Mm -hmm. Not for this one. Every match had a stipulation. They leaned into what the gimmick show is supposed to be. All right, pop in a ladder match, have an I quit match, a strap match, an extreme rules match. The Brawling Brutes and Imperium went out there and tore the house down with the Donnybrook match, and this was just fun. It was a no DQ match, and it was everything a multi-man match like this needed to be. Edge and Finn Balor had an I quit match that really exceeded my expectations. For sure. It brought the brutality and it took Rhea holding Edge's wife hostage for him to finally so quit. So brutal, bro. And then what this show was built on, and that was the fight pit match. And you'll see this more than once in this video. And that's introducing a new concept to a widespread WWE fan base and making it a reason to tune in. Something that fans that only watch the main roster probably hadn't seen before. And it was well executed. I'd also be remiss not to mention Bray Wyatt coming out to end the show. Mm -hmm. The way this was presented had everyone talking, coming into the show, and going out of it. Mm -hmm. So, another strong paper. Huge pop. What's next? That was Crown Jewel. For Bray. Now, for the longest time, these Saudi pay-per-views were just some other world, and not in a good way. These shows were flat out trash. They would just parade out nostalgia <laughs> acts for the sake of it. And not only was it not fun to watch, it was literally putting the health and safety of those competitors on the line. These matches would come out of nowhere and for no reason. Do I need to remind you of the disaster that was Goldberg versus Undertaker mm. or the Brothers of no. Destruction versus DX? No. At one point, they brought in a fake Yokozuna. Those were some dark, dark times. Now these shows aren't just their own little side quest. They factor into the overall grand scheme of the WWE. And oftentimes, they'll also get big angles and matches. Bailey and Bianca went out there and just had the craziest, most SmackDown, here comes the pain match ever. Logan Paul and Roman <laughs> Reigns was way better than yeah, it had any right to be. Definitely it had the perfect good. amount of big spots mixed with the craziness that makes wrestling so fun. Was it the greatest show? No, but it wasn't bad. Earlier, Mm -hmm. I talked about them building a show around a foreign concept for the more untraditional fans with the fight pit. Well, instead of the proper Survivor Series, this year, we got a new selling point, and that was War Games. Something that so many fans had wanted on the main roster for the longest time. Not to mention that aside from the two War Games matches, 
Theory, Rollins, and Lashley had an extremely strong U.S. championship match. Mm -hmm. And then we also had two War Games matches. The men's one focused around the continuing story of the bloodline, and it was a breath of fresh air. Rather than the traditional five-on-five or brand warfare concept that the WWE loves, we had something exciting and something fresh. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a pay-per-view in December, which is great. You don't need to have one every single month, so we didn't get a TLC or a payback or whatever they pop into there. Instead, those TLC-type stipulations, it feels as though have just been folded into the normal WWE pay-per-views. To start 2023, it was the Royal Rumble, and just by virtue of the poster, the rumors started to swirl. Yep. Would he finally stop going to every jungle under the sun and come back to the WWE? The answer to that is no. He's too busy <laughs> showing up literally everywhere else. But the finish to the Rumble didn't really need him. To start off, we had the Rumble match, which personally speaking, I thought tailed off after Brock Lesnar got eliminated. It was building up to something special, and then for me, it just didn't hit that next gear. We had Cody return at number 30 from his pectoral injury and get the win. But before that, I wish he probably would have returned like at a higher number. I still think him returning after um, Seth Rollins return, like him, like him, his number being called after Seth Rollins, I think that would have been a great story to tell. Logan Paul and Ricochet did a clothesline spot where both of them leapt from their side of the ring to meet in the middle. Also, Gunther versus Cody was a solid, solid final two. I really Definitely. enjoyed their mini match, and it was a great way to finish things off. There was a Mountain Dew pitch black match, Ugh. which I thought looked cool, and it was ambitious, but it the match was pretty trash yeah the women's royal rumble match was a huge moment for Rhea going coast to coast to start her ascension to the top of the wwe mm -hmm. and then to end the night Sami Zayn made his decision by turning on roman oh, reigns so and good, the moment bro. that chair shot hit was one of the loudest pops ever, ever to add to that jay left so you were just questioning what happens next oh, it was legitimately so good, one of the bro. craziest pay-per-view endings i've ever seen so good and it received a mainly positive reaction it left you wanting more the Bloodline story has been a key strength for WWE pay-per-view endings, and now you can completely tell that the focus was more on quality rather than quantity mm -hmm. and moments over minutes. That brought us to the Great White North, and on this day, I don't know if I saw it clearly, but man, was I ever proud to be Canadian because Montreal <laughs> yeah. showed out for Elimination Chamber. So the main good. event for this was <laughs> Sami Zayn versus Roman Reigns, and just like Clash of the... Is, can we just just taking in the fact that he's going through these pay-per-views PLEs, whatever you want to call them and it just brings back good memories consistently there's always something on the show that you can be like damn that was good it's not just one thing a few things that you can be like damn that was good too man I, I need to go back and watch this match man I need to go back and watch this segment man I need to go back and watch this match and it can all be on the same show I wish the weekly shows had that type of uh, consistency. You know, it's only in a perfect world. You can't be perfect. But once again, it's good to be able to say that consistently man at the castle the crowd favorite was built up to actually look like a threat and you didn't know do they actually do it do they actually pull the trigger the atmosphere was electric they were chanting f you roman they were mercilessly booing him like oh, there was no so tomorrow good. and it seemed like there very well wouldn't be but just like drew sammy couldn't get the job done aside from that the u.s championship elimination chamber match was genuinely really strong everyone in that mm -hmm. match got their time to shine which is so important in a match like that it was filled with a ton of big spots and it led to a memorable match that's worth a rewatch for the sure women's match also had their spots but it wasn't as strong as the men's mm -hmm. not every match on these pay-per-views have been good though there's one that stink up the entire card mm -hmm. and make me question my fandom Lashley versus Brock Lesnar was ass on a stick. Literally, all <laughs> of them I thought were bad, with each of them progressively getting worse. Never did I think that these two would miss every single time. But regardless, it was another pay-per-view away from home base in the U.S. And it was a fun night with lots to talk about. And if you want something to talk about, let's go to WrestleMania, where we said goodbye Ooh. to the 30s. Was this show perfect? Absolutely not. But it did have some high points. It had star power. It had a huge feel to it. It had an exceptional night stage. Night 1 was great. Over two I love nights, night you saw one. Brock Lesnar, Roman Reigns, John Cena, Edge, Becky Lynch, Cody Rhodes, among others. Seth Rollins and Logan Paul was a match that many thought had big time potential and it was really fun. It was shenanigans mm -hmm. filled. It was again 
everything that it needed to be. Ray and Dom was also fun from mm-hmm. the entrances to the murdering of booze for Dominic and the story <laughs> leading in was also strong. So when you saw Ray Mysterio standing there, it just all came together. Rhea and Charlotte started off slow, but man, that no match way. really picked up Woo-hoo. and the two delivered one of the best women's wrestling matches out there. Batch. Rhea getting the win and her crowning moment. And speaking of crowning moments, Owens and Zayn got theirs when they main evented WrestleMania and won the undisputed oh, tag so team fun. titles. Night one was such a special night to night be a one fan. Was so good. It was everything come together perfectly. You got to see big stars, you got surprises, you got great action and fun matches. Night two had the potential to be even better. And though there were bright spots, I don't think that it lived up to night one. Yeah. One of my biggest gripes. I think a lot of people said that night one was it just was it was just really good, bro. Consistently good. So many matches you can go back and watch on night one. And you just be like, yeah. Night two, it wasn't the best. It wasn't, the, I mean, it wasn't the worst. I wouldn't say it was just like awful. There are a few matches on night two you can definitely sink your teeth into. But overall, if I had to choose, I'm definitely choosing night one because it was just, just fantastic, bro. With this show was some of the matches and the overall pacing of it. I get that Brock Lesnar wanted to work with Omos. But man, it really didn't do anything for either of them. The women's showcase match wasn't that great either, so you started off on the wrong foot. However, the in-ring highlight from WrestleMania 39 Mm -hmm. for a lot of people, including myself, was the Intercontinental Championship match between Gunther, Sheamus, and Drew McIntyre. If you wanted destruction and a flat-out collision, that's exactly what you got. Chop after chop, big move after big move. What stood out to me in this match was it's a triple threat match, so there's no rules. There were no weapon spots in this match. No announced <laughs> table spot. Just a pure slugfest between these three and guys. That's what makes that so great, bro. They just went out there and beat the crap out of each other. They didn't need furniture. They just did it. And it still worked. Guys, the whole arena, me included, were giving these guys a standing ovation because they legitimately stole the show with Gunther continuing his impressive IC championship reign. Edge and Finn Balor was cut short due to Finn getting busted open, but mm-hmm. we still got a really sweet coup de gras attempt from Finn regardless. Also, I thought that Finn should have been the one to go over. And then we got to the main event match, which was one of the most unpredictable main events in Ooh, such a long time between bro. Cody Rhodes and Ooh. Roman Reigns. And these two delivered in the match. Don't let the finish deter you from what oh, was no, an Oh, no, I will always say that the match was great. Match 10 out of 10. That match was so damn good had the crowd on the edge of their feet i do disagree with the finish but hey they're making the best out of it they are making it the best out of it as you can see now the bloodline storyline is at a fever pitch even higher than what it was at wrestlemania damn near well close to it um but that match i will tell anybody go watch that main event you may not like the ending but go watch that match. That match was main event worthy. The match. The crowd investment was high and there were so many near falls and it looked like it was Cody's night. But again, thanks to Solo, it wouldn't be. To me, it almost felt like the Samoan spike bit was supposed to be a part of the match where there was supposed to be a kick out rather than it being the closing sequence. To me, it wasn't really that Roman won. It was more so that the finish felt kind of anticlimactic. But what can you do? It was still a good match by all accounts. Some other highlights were the men's showcase match from night one and Bianca versus Asuka, which was Mm -hmm. good. But it suffered from being the follow-up to the triple threat match. Yeah. That was WrestleMania. Night one was definitely the more complete show where I thought night two didn't really live up to the night before. But nonetheless, a fun WrestleMania. How could I forget Backlash? Live from San Juan, Puerto Rico. So one of the most good. rowdy crowds in WWE history. So there's good. There's being a crowd, and then there's a crowd adding to the experience, and these they, guys did oh just that. God. They turned what's usually a B-tier pay-per-view into a party, and it was... They made Backlash seem like an A-tier pay-per-view. Backlash. <laughs> It's just fun. Bad Bunny and Damian Priest in a San Juan street fight. 
Bad Bunny coming out to one of the loudest ovations in the company's history. The whole crowd singing Chambea. Shout out to WWE for finally learning that Booker T isn't the only song that he has. And these two just <laughs> casually tore the house down. Mm -hmm. Genuinely, Bad Bunny has no right to be as good as he is. And I think every wrestling fan has to respect him because of the respect that he gives to the business. Mm -hmm. He honestly doesn't have to be taking these bumps. No. But there he was <laughs> living out a childhood fantasy and it was amazing. We had the LWO come out carlito rocked up it was violent it was fast paced and it was also the moment where many fans realized the genius of damian priest mm -hmm. selena vega also had an emotional homecoming and again these matches and this pay-per-view in ring wise wasn't the craziest but the crowd amplified mm -hmm. everything so much more night of champions was another strong showing and it was sold on two things who would become the first ever world heavyweight champion and would roman and solo actually win the tag team titles yep. aj and seth did what they always do and they showed out with seth rollins becoming the new world heavyweight champion Could have been a better match. we also had a really special moment for Sami Zayn competing in saudi arabia yeah. and you could just tell how much this meant to him from the look on his face the match was your normal roman reigns tag match with all the tropes you'd expect but it was what happened during it which left everyone talking we had the super kick that was heard around the Not world when Jimmy Uso finally made his decision to stand against Roman Whoop. and the breakup of the bloodline was underway. <laughs> After a few weeks of TV, we were back to the United Kingdom for Money in the Bank mm -hmm. where the bloodline civil war took center stage. Woo. But coming in, the hype was around a different man. And that was Knight. LA Knight, who many fans wanted to win the Money in the Bank ladder match. That didn't happen though. Logan Paul and Ricochet continued to make moments together. This looked scary and they did slip up and the landing didn't look the best, but I'm glad none of them are injured. For sure. At the end of it all, it was Damian Priest standing tall, took the win. And I know a lot of people wanted to see LA Knight win. I did too. But some fans are just writing off Damian Priest because it wasn't the guy they wanted. Yeah. There's big time potential with this man to become a huge star in the WWE. Every time he's been put into a prominent position, he's shown that he can hold that spot. For and sure. storyline wise, there's so much to lean into with mm -hmm. the Judgment Day. Do they have Finn win in a rematch at SummerSlam with Rollins only for Priest to become world champion after a cash in? Mm -hmm. Or do they do a slower burn? There's a lot of different directions this could go. We had Shayna randomly turn on Ronda, which I don't think anyone expected at this point. Gunther had another strong showing against Riddle. I feel as though the match needed another five minutes to really get into that next gear. He retained and then the roof blew off the place when Drew McIntyre returned and the crowd lost its mind. After Beautiful so much moment. talk of contract disputes and creative issues and whatever, there he was. And it looks like these two are going to destroy one another at SummerSlam. Ooh, can't so, wait. Cool. You get your big return. Everyone will go home happy. But no. Out comes John, John Cena, Cena out of nowhere making his man. second Money in the Bank return in three years. And what an amazing moment this was. Mad respect to him for showing up. The women's ladder match was uncontrolled chaos. There were some botchy spots in mm -hmm. there. You could really tell that there were some mess ups, but it was a lot of fun to watch. Everyone was flying around everywhere. And though it wasn't perfect, I thought it was the best one to date for the women. Io Sky getting the win after such a creative finish, handcuffing Bailey and Becky to each other through the rungs of the ladder and climbing to victory. Yep. To end the show, it was the Bloodline Civil War. Ooh. The Usos versus Roman and Solo. So Let's good. Let's just cut to the chase. Roman Reigns got pinned for the first time <laughs> in three and a half years. And the man who did it was Boy, the first person, person who ever pinned him. Yep. The same one who did it in 2013. Jey Uso, the same man who had been tormented since 2020, so good. the same man who Roman knew would never take his spot, was able to keep his shoulders down to the mat, one, two, three. Crazy moment. There was also a cool kick out where Roman and Solo hit Jay with a spike spear combo. That was then so Roman sick. tried to pin both twins, but they wouldn't say die. The story of Jey Uso continues, and the question becomes, what next? The crowd at Money in the Bank amplified everything so much more and gave us yet another great WWE event, which is what this retrospective is about. The resurgence of WWE pay-per-views. Mm -hmm. The amount of crazy crowds we've had in the past year is actually insane. On average, there's about seven matches on the show, and in the past year, there's been so many different things that have happened in these shows. From this, to this, to this, <laughs> yep. and so much in between. <laughs> I believe so focusing cool, on man. quality over quantity has helped the last little bit. For content sure. for the sake of content is something that you guys know I don't believe in. 
not having a pay-per-view every three weeks or every single month has also helped the stadium shows feel big and by virtue of them needing to sell these out they put on bigger matches with that there's more international pay-per-views leaving the u.s has given us some yes. of the craziest crowds in a long long yes. time matches matter storylines also matter but as always this is just one guy's observation and one guy's thoughts let me know what do you guys think of wwe pay-per-views in recent memory are they actually more consistent are they better do you think they've gotten better or are they just the same do you agree do you disagree let me know i'll catch you guys in the next hey man i gotta definitely get this video like i'll go subscribe to the homie super kick studios he it's funny like i said i thought about this like just was randomly thinking about this and for him to do this video was awesome man and i am total agreeance the since SummerSlam of last year the pay-per-views have been fantastic there's not one pay-per-view i can think of where i was like oh that was boring no something happens each and every time that wants you to <laughs> ironically check out what's gonna happen on monday night raw and most of the time it doesn't live up to uh what happens on monday night raw because most of the time nothing happens really on monday night raw or whatever but you know it still makes you invested in the fact that they've been selling out these shows relatively quick lets you know that the fans want to be at these PLEs because they know something big's about to happen and I want to be there. So I expect SummerSlam this year to be crazy, the crowd to be crazy, and I expect something crazy to happen at that show. I expect good matches, good storytelling. Like I said, I wish they could transfer some of that uh, energy to the weekly shows consistently, you know, as consistently as they could possibly do it. But at the same time, man, they are killing it, bro. They are legitimately killing it on the main roster. I mean, on on the, uh, for the main pay-per-views. And I am, it's really cool to be able to say that, that for the first time in quite some time, the WWE PLEs pay-per-views have been consistently great. So, to you know, piggyback piggyback off of what he uh, asked, man, how do you guys feel? Do you guys agree that the uh, pay-per-views slash PLEs have been consistently great for almost a year now? And have you guys been enjoying them, or do you guys feel like? They're more or less the same. Let me know down below. But I appreciate all the love and support you guys showing on the channel. Road to 150k. And I'm still here in the YouTube wrestling champion of the world. Appreciate y'all kicking me. See you on the next one. Peace.